In light of what's been happening in Egypt and the wider Middle East with the Arab Spring, there is a justification that's wheeled out regarding the US's support of Mubarak and that he represented stability in the region. Of course, as a justification, it falls apart as soon as you examine it closely. However, is there ever a case when you would countenance supporting a tyrant, at least in the short term, because destabilising the region could precipitate catastrophic repercussions for the whole species and the closest analogue I can think of, maybe Pakistan? Well, you can imagine all kinds of things, but uh, before we even discuss this, you have to decode the terminology, at least. The term stability has a kind of technical meaning in foreign policy discourse. What it means is subordination to U.S. interests. That's stability. And in fact, Egypt's a very striking case. Uh, so, for example, if you read press commentary and foreign policy commentary, they say exactly what you said. In fact, they go on to say that the uh, 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 1979 uh, Egypt-Israel um, peace treaty is the cornerstone of stability in the region. Now, that's a very interesting interpretation because in the real world, it's the cornerstone of instability in the region. Uh, the, and that's precisely why the Egyptian population is so strongly opposed to it and why the West so strongly wants it. Just take a look. As soon as the peace treaty was signed, uh, Israeli analysts, strategic analysts, right away began to write about the meaning of it, which is transparent. It removes Egypt from the conflict. Egypt is the only military force in the Arab world, so it eliminates the sole deterrent and therefore it frees Israel to carry out uh, actions, often very violent actions, without concern. Uh, very shortly they invaded Lebanon on no pretext at all, credible pretext, uh, killed about 20,000 people, uh, destroyed much of southern Lebanon, tried though failed to install their own uh, government, uh, and expanded their uh, their illegal um, occupation uh, in the occupied territory, settlements and so on. Well, that's, you know, by the standards of some objective observer, that's instability. But by the standards of the power systems, that's stability. Uh, so therefore, it's the cornerstone of stability in the region. Uh, Mubarak uh, kept stability. Uh, this usage is all over the place. Uh, so take, say, Iran, the other huge foreign policy issue. Uh, the Iranian threat is supposed to be the worst problem in the world. If you look at uh, foreign policy literature and media, you know, governments, a terrible Iranian threat. Well, you know, the Iranian government is certainly a threat to its own population, uh, but they're hardly unique in that respect. Uh, but uh, so what exactly is the Iranian threat? Well, it's kind of interesting that in all the discussion about it, that question is almost never raised. However, there is an answer to it, an authoritative answer. It comes from the Pentagon and U.S. intelligence. Uh, every year they present an, to Congress an analysis of the global security situation. Uh, the most recent one, uh, of course, uh, discussed the Iranian threat, which they think is very severe. Uh, but it's interesting to see what they said. Uh, the, they said it's not a military threat. Uh, Iran has very low military expenses, even by standards of the region. It uh, has little capacity to deploy force. Its military strategy is designed to try to hold off an, a ground invasion long enough for diplomacy to set in. Uh, they, of course, talked about nuclear capability. They mm -hmm. said if Iran is developing nuclear weapons capability, it would be part of their deterrent strategy. So that's the military threat. Nevertheless, they're a huge threat. Why? They're destabilizing the region. How are they doing it? By trying to increase their, uh, improve their relations with neighboring countries. So they're trying to improve uh, commercial, um, cultural, political, other uh, interactions with uh, Iraq and Afghanistan. And that's destabilizing. Now, when, we, in, when the U.S. and Britain invade the countries, occupy them, half destroy them, you know, kill hundreds of thousands of people, that's stabilizing. <laughs> uh, and until you understand the terminology, you can't even discuss these questions. Okay. In fact, the whole terminology of political discourse is sort of reshaped so as to make it almost impossible to talk sensibly. So to go back, 
your question, uh, suppose that we had, a, let's take, say, Pakistan. Uh, the, uh, uh, Pakistan is a very dangerous country, undoubtedly. Uh, the main danger is uh, number, has internal problems, huge internal problems. It's a kind of patchwork of separate uh, you know, federated units, different languages, different cultures, mm -hmm. and so on. Uh, but there are two main problems for of international concern. Uh, one is it's uh, actually the most rapidly growing nuclear power. Pakistan. Pakistan. So a huge nuclear power, you know, growing very fast. It's part of their competition with India. And secondly, it has a, uh, it has a substantial, not overwhelming, but a substantial uh, radical Islamist streak. And we saw that recently when the, uh, the governor of Punjab was assassinated. Uh, there was enormous, he was assassinated because of his opposition to the blasphemy law and the way it was used to persecute a young woman who was charged. So he was assassinated. There was overwhelming support for the assassinate, ass assassins. And a lot of that support was coming from the black suited uh, lawyers who were being hailed because they uh, led the reform movement that overthrew Musharraf. That's where the support for the assassin was coming from. Well, these are, it's not a majority. They don't get a majority in any election, but it's there. Uh, these are part of Reagan's gift to the world. Uh, the Reagan administration pretended they didn't know that Iran was developing, uh, Pakistan was developing nuclear weapons, though of course they did. And they supported the worst dictator in the history of Pakistan, Zia al who was radically Islamizing the country with the support of Saudi Arabia, the major U.S., U.K. ally in the region. So this, and in fact, uh, uh, both the U.S. and Britain have tended to support uh, radical Islam for a long period. There's quite a good book that just came out on this by a British diplomatic historian, Mark Curtis. Uh, uh, it's also true of the United Britain, on Britain uh, but it's also true of the United States. And Pakistan's a case in point. So yes, there's a radical Islamist sector. There's a, big nuclear power, there's a lot of internal problems. Uh, what do we do about this? Well, uh, one thing we do about it is try to exacerbate it. And so if you take a look at the problems that Pakistan is facing, it has one stable institution, the military. It's highly stable, highly professional, uh, dedicated to the uh, uh, protection of Pakistani sovereignty, and the U.S. is pushing it to the wall. Uh, Overwhelmingly, uh, Pakistanis support the right of the Taliban to defend their Afghan Taliban, not Pakistani Taliban, the right of the Afghani ta Taliban to defend their country against aggression. They don't like the, the Taliban. They didn't like the Mujahideen uh, during the Russian invasion. But they do support their right to defend the country against uh, aggression. The United States is demanding that they take part in that fight. Well, that causes tensions. And furthermore, the drone attacks, which are just, they're just terror weapons. I mean, if there were drone attacks here, there could be one five minutes, we wouldn't know about it. Uh, that's what drone attacks are. They're terror weapons. Uh, and the Pakistanis bitterly resent them, the military too, and not just because of the kind of weapon they are, but just because they're bombing Pakistan. Uh, there are uh, pressure on the Pakistani army to uh, uh, participate in the U.S. war, to go into the tribal areas, to uh, prevent uh, bases from which uh, uh, the U.S. troops in Afghanistan occupying army can be attacked. I mean, like if the Russians had tried anything like this during the Russian invasion of Afghanistan, uh, we'd have had a nuclear war, you know? Yeah. And nobody would have tolerated it. But, and the Pakistani army is infuriated. Uh, that's dangerous. Uh, if they are forced into a military confrontation, they'll fight. Every military specialist on Afghanistan, Pakistan, points this out. And that could even lead to the leakage of uh, fissile materials into jihadi hands. And this has just happened right before our eyes and is not being discussed. Now take the bin Laden assassination. Yeah. Uh, that was obviously an attack on Pakistani sovereignty. They sent you know, 79 commandos in to assassinate someone. But more than that, they were under orders to fight their way out if they had to. 
if they the if American troops American commanders the orders were fight your way out and fight your way out means you're going to get air support and all sorts of things you'd be at war with the Pakistani army and they'll fight and then comes possible cycle uh, maybe nuclear weapons going to the hands of jihadis well the Obama administration and Britain were willing to chance that uh, is that stabilizing it's quite the opposite. In fact, one of the major experts on Pakistani military, Anatol Yevin, is a military historian in England, one of the main experts on Pakistan. Now, he wrote recently, he has a book that just came out which talks about this in detail, uh, but in an article he had recently, he said that uh, American and British uh, soldiers are dying in Afghanistan to make the world more dangerous for the United States and Britain. Uh, and, uh, well, we call that stabilization.